Canada, family. Man, happy Father's Day, everybody. Uh, you know what, I especially before I get into the word, I just, I especially Pastor John, I want to talk to you because um, as all of us here know, Pastor John um, just recently lost his dad who has, he's honestly been like a spiritual dad to a lot of us, even me. I mean, I have to tell you, like I've, I've had some real uh, pivotal theological conversations where I needed Father Rabbi Neil. And uh, anyway, John, I just want to bless you and honor you. I also just want to honor the heritage of your dad and the memory of him. So uh, if you've got a Bible, though, if you would take it out, go to Matthew 6. John, I love you a lot. And South Florida guys, love you guys a lot. Matthew chapter 6, if you would take out a Bible, go to Matthew 6. Stand up on your feet. That'd be great. I'm Mike Pats. Uh, I'm one of the pastors around here. And I'm going to see some of you in South Florida in a matter of weeks, actually. And we're in a series that is about money, and it is Father's Day, and it does not, um, I don't know, it's not an easy time for some of us. And I, before I even get into the word, I really want to proclaim the peace of the Lord on all of us. Uh, some of us have, uh, have distant fathers, and maybe today's a painful day because of that. Some of us have lost fathers, like Pastor John. Um, some of us are fathers that are just wondering if we're completely ruining our children's lives because uh, we don't know what in the world we're doing unless God helps us. And I just want to say to you, all of you, all of us, uh, Father God's ability to pull this off is a lot bigger than your ability to mess this up. All right? So I speak the blessing of Father God over you, over your mind, over your body, over your soul, over your emotions, over your finances, over your home, in Jesus' name. You receive that? All right. I cannot wait to talk about what I'm about to talk about. <laughs> so I'm really hoping this comes out like it's going on right in here right now. So we're going to see what happens. Matthew 6, 24, no one, everyone say no one. No one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money or mammon. It's a Syriac word, mammon. Uh, and, and today we're talking about money is second part of this. You cannot serve two masters. I'm going to hit the rest of the chapter, but I'm going to stop right now, and I'm going to pray, God, help. Do something strong in this place. I feel like, Father, that there are people that have been tormented for decades that today that ends in the name of Jesus. I really believe, Lord, there are people being set free on this day, whether in South Florida, North Florida, or somewhere else in the world. This is the day that you have made for freedom, and I announce that freedom in Jesus' name. And everybody shouted, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Let me just jump right in because I just want to go at it. Have you ever watched a movie and you can't quite figure out who the villain is? You ever watched one of those movies? Like the most recent Mission Impossible movie was a movie where... You're trying to figure out who's the bad guy here, who's the villain, because it's not clear. Because as you're going along, you, you watch the protagonist, the main character, like confiding in somebody, and, and you're sort of wondering, like, wait, wait, can you trust him? Can you trust her? Who's the bad guy? Who's the mole? Who's the villain? Who is the, ba who's the antagonist in this situation? Now, hold that thought for a second, because we're in this series where last week we opened up and and we talked about where Jesus said that where your, where your treasure goes, that's where your heart's going to go, that your, your heart always follows your treasure. Let, let me just say it a little bit differently. Whoever gets your money gets your life, period. It's a fact. We try to compartmentalize things. Jesus actually makes it very clear. You can't serve God and money. The primary, in fact, the only um, apparent complete opposite master that Jesus contrasts with Almighty God is the not-so-almighty dollar, the, the money, mammon. And so we know that whoever gets your money gets your life. It's just, it's just a fact. Your heart is going to go there. Your life is going to go there. You cannot compartmentalize you. You cannot separate it, which means that when we talked last week that whoever gets a good eye, a good eye meant a good approach to the way that you're viewing this, especially money. Whoever controls that money is going to control the life. So who is the villain is the question. Who is the villain when it comes to poking your eyeballs out? Who is the villain when it comes to giving you a bad eye? Who is the villain that messes with you and me in a way that something happens when it comes to our money and our stuff, that money becomes a master over us instead of a servant under us, and it throws all of our life off? Who is it that does that to us? Because I keep on talking to people, and I, I meet people all the time that have these dreams. 
We have, a lot of, we have so many, half our church is about as college students. So uh, I'll talk to college students that are uh, in, in grad school, they're in law school, and they're like, um, why are you doing law? They're like, because I have a heart for justice. God's awakened my heart for justice. I want to change the world for justice. Mike, I want to use my life. I want to leverage my education. God's given me abilities, and God's given me skills, and, and I want to use this for, for good, and I want to use this to change the world, and I want to use this to, to do something substantial. So I'm at UF, and I'm, I'm do, well, how's it going? Well, I had to take out loans for this and everything, but I'm going to do this, and when I get out, I mean, one of these days I'm going to do some justice work. And then I've heard, I heard people tell me that like 10 and 12 years ago. And then I have had some conversations with some people that have come back to visit sometimes and, and they've gone off and they've come back and they're like, man, Mike, oh. I said, what's going on? I'm just so restless. I'm like, what do you mean you're restless? Well, I'm, here I am, I'm 34 years old now. I'm just working at a firm and I'm kind of making my way up. And I'm like, well, what happened? They're like, oh man, money happened. I started making money and then when you started making money, you hear that you got to protect your money, and I'm, I need to save it for retirement. I don't have any kids yet, but I need to save it for my kids' education, and, and what, what if I got cancer? I need money for that, and, and, and what if this happened tomorrow, and I need that, and, and I got all, the, and, and, and I haven't full, paid off all my debts yet, and, and man, you know, I remember 12 years ago, I went into this because I was hoping to go change the world, and here I am like a cog in the system because I need the mo- I'm making more money than I ever dreamt of, but I'm, but I'm stuck. I have these dreams. I've, I've talked to immigrants in our church that, that told me, they know, they're like, Mike, do you know what it's like to grow up on the side of a mountain that when it rains really hard, the mudslides come down. And when the mudslides come down, it, it gets into your little you know, hut of a, of a shack called a house. And it gets in there and it ruins things. And your dad gets in a bad mood and your dad starts to drink and your dad starts to, to beat your mom. And, and, and their marriage is horrible. And I, and I just, I know in my, in my mind, it's like, I'm like, man, if I could ever get out of here. And here's what happens. Money promises to fulfill your dreams. If you had enough money, you would never have to live on the side of a mountain again. If you had enough money, man, you'd be able to get out of this. And then, and then you wouldn't be living on the side of a hut where your mom and your dad were a, were a mother and a father, a husband and a wife. They start to, if you got enough money, then it would all be good. And yet here I am. I'm now 42 years old. And I've got more money than I ever dreamt possible in my country that I came from. And yet me and my wife are about to get divorced. And there's no mud coming in our house. There's only mud being slung with our mouths as we fight. Or I've talked to people that have told me they know what it's like to grow up in a, in a home where there was never enough and you could feel it. You could taste, you could taste the poverty in the air. I know what it's like, people have told me, to, to grow up in, for, what's for dinner tonight? And it's saltine crackers with mayonnaise on top. And to say, man, I, one day I want to be in a place where no child of mine is ever going to have to eat saltine crackers with mayonnaise and we're going to have three square meals a day and, and money tells us, money promises us these dreams you have of being able to provide for a child and then I'll talk to the parents sometimes in my office that'll say, man, we've got all the money that we would need to get three. We've never not had three square meals a day since we've had children and yet this week I found myself letting the words slip out when I told my child, I wish you were never born and he ran out of the house. See, money makes these promises that these dreams that you have are going to somehow be fulfilled. By all. I mean, I remember when I was a child, growing up with a single mom. I mean, if you would have seen me my senior year of high school, my, the door of my bedroom was full of bills from $1, $5, $10, $20, $50, $100. And I said, I'm going to be an attorney one day because when I'm going to be an attorney. And I'm not going to have the, le- the lack and the need that, that I have sensed here in my house. And, and there were these dreams of like, if only you could get this money, that this would, your, all your dreams would come true. But when I talk to people that have gotten gotten the money, they have not gotten their dreams because somehow money doesn't have what it takes to fulfill the promises that it made. So who's the villain? Who's the, who's the villain here? What is it, what is it that happened? Because in the reason, the reason I'm, I'm pushing the question is if you misidentify the villain, you're going to misidentify the solution. If you misidentify the problem, you're never going to get the solution right. And if you don't know who the villain is when it comes to money, and if you don't know who the, I'm, I'm just saying the chief villain. If you don't know who the chief villain is, there's always going to be an issue. And so when we come to verse 24, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. You love the one, hate the other, be devoted to the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, when we go to verse 25, he says, therefore, now stop. Because whatever he's about to say, it's a response to who is the villain when it comes to 
You cannot serve God and money. You can't. Who is the villain that's trying to get you? Who is the villain that's trying to get me? Who is the villain that is trying to get us to not turn to the living God as our master, but to allow some, he says, because whatever he's doing, this is where he's going right now. Therefore, now what I expect him to say is, you can't serve God and money. Therefore, baby, you better deal with selfishness. You better deal with greed. Oh, you can't serve God and money. Therefore, you better knock out greed because human beings are greedy and materialistic and selfish and wicked. In South Florida, you can't serve God and money. Therefore, don't be greedy. That's what I'm expecting him to say. But that's not what he says. What does he say? Therefore, I tell you, do not be what? Do not be anxious. It's like, wait, wait. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Six times we're going to find in this passage, in the rest of these verses, he's going to say, verse 27, and which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to the span of his life? Verse 28, and why are you anxious about your clothing. Verse 31, therefore do not be anxious. Verse 34, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. When it comes to money, he, Jesus has already made the, the case. Whoever gets your money gets you. Whoever gets your money gets your life. Money is going to scream. You've got dreams, I'll meet your dreams. Jesus is saying money doesn't have it in it to meet your dreams. And there's an enemy, there is a villain, there is an arch villain that's going to try to get you to get unbiblical and ungodly and ridiculous with your money, and that villain is actually not greed, and that villain is actually not, prim don't get me wrong, there is greed, but it's not primarily greed, and it's not primarily selfishness, it is primarily, at the end of the day, fear. Number one, fear is the villain. 366 times in scripture, the word of God says, fear not. In Spanish, no temas. No temais. Everyone say, no temas. Don't fear, don't fear, don't fear. In fact, can we just say it like a prophecy to someone near you? Say, fear not. In fact, if you want, you can say it like a prophet. You can be, fear not. You can say it like that. Go ahead. <laughs> Pastor John, fear not. Fear is the villain. <laughs> See, fear will get you to do things that, that you wouldn't otherwise do. Some, now, I want to get clear. Fear is not all bad, okay? My kids are swimming. I tell them it's time to get out. I see some storm clouds coming. They don't get out of the pool. You know, hey kids, it's time to get out. We were down in South Florida at, the, at, at Hollywood Beach one time and, and we we're at some pool there or whatever. And, and uh, kids, it's time to get out. They're not getting out. Time to, you can see that, you know, out by the beach when you can see, I'm like, you better get out. They don't. And all of a sudden, the, the storm come, hasn't even shown up yet, but there is thunder and lightning that would make your hair cringe. And all of a sudden, within three seconds or less, all my children are out of the water. Now, I say that to say fear is not a bad thing. Any of you that are like scientists or your doctors, like, well, Mike, you, do, you are aware that fear serves a purpose and anxiety serves a purpose and, and concern serves a purpose, and it does. In the short term, fear is a gift from God that will save your backside. Okay, you're walking down an aisle, you're walking down an alley, you're in the middle of New York City, all of a sudden you hear a noise, and you hear someone coming out there like, hoo, hoo, ha, 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 something like that. All of a sudden, you get this adrenaline rush, and scientists will tell us that your body actually reroutes resources to the parts of your brain that are called survival mechanisms, okay? So there are parts of your brain, you could have been hungry looking for a piece of I love New York pizza in New York, when you hear the hoo, hoo, ha, 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 when you hear that, you're your, your hunger drive actually shuts down. Your body stops fighting other diseases. All resources, if this was the Star Trek, Star Trek Enterprise, we've put all shields up on the front right there because your body goes into full-fledged survival mode. Now, guys, that's not a bad thing. This is what, this is, you know, Pastor Robbie drove on the property this morning, and there was a, a deer about halfway up the, the front of the property as you're driving on the hub. And, and I don't know if you've ever seen a deer when they get afraid. When deer get afraid, they run faster. When deer get afraid, they, they can run sharper. Their, their, their senses are all acute. And, it's, and here's the catch. Fear in the short run can be a gift from God to preserve your life, to help you survive. But God's vision for your life was never to just survive. He wants you to thrive. Now, now, you need to catch this. 
Because when you live in fear, you ream out your body and your soul and your mind and your heart because what you do is when you're living in a constant, and this is what happens when, when we get riddled with anxiety, what happens is we, we, we take what would have been a gift from God because it's okay to be concerned. But you've got to do something with the concern. It's okay to be afraid. It is. That's not, that's not when the Bible says fear not, it doesn't mean when you hear the hoo hoo ha 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 in the middle of an alley in New York City, it doesn't mean you say, I am not afraid. I will stand right here. I will sit right here. I will sit here. No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean when you see a bus coming, you're like, is that a mirage or is that a bus coming? Something in me is saying, run. No, it's okay to run for a minute, but you can't run 24 7. And it's okay to be concerned for a minute. But when Jesus says, when he's saying here, listen, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What makes fear so insidious is that it's a backdoor sin in the long run. Okay? See, see there's some things that are just obvious. Greed, it's like, oh, it's obvious. Lying, it's obvious. Fear is like a backdoor thing that doesn't even feel like a sin because... Because I feel like fear and anxiety and worry are things that happen to me that I have nothing to do with. By the way, I mean, how do you repent of something that happens to you? Or, or let me just say it more clearly. How do you possibly apply the most common command in Scripture to fear not if you've got no control of your fear? If all you are is the victim of your fear, you can never turn away from something that you're a victim to. You just have to sit around and wait for something to change. And yet what Jesus says, he says, I want you to, do, therefore, because of this, this competition, who's the villain? The villain is fear. The word is, it's a Greek word, merimnaho. It means to, to be anxious or to be troubled with cares, to have your mind full of cares. And what he says here, and by the time you get to verse 26, look at the birds. Verse 27, though, he says, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Which of you, what, what he's letting you know is this. He, he's, he's making the appeal, fear just doesn't work. Like, you're worried about it. It just flat out doesn't work. Now, here's what I need you catching. When you are afraid and you're living in fear, you will be an otherwise rational person but don't miss this, when you are afraid, you become irrational. When you're living in anxiety, you become irrational. Guys, I was in Spain. I was over in Spain at the Project Rescue Safe House. I was looking at these girls that had been rescued out of human trafficking. And if you could have seen that, looked in the eyes of one of the girls that just started crying and says, why did my mom and dad, mom and dad sold me? Because they had so many children. And you know what it was? They were just so afraid they wouldn't have enough money and all their kids would die. So better to lose one of them. Why me? With tears in her eyes. Why me? Why? And the answer is because when people are afraid and anxious and they're in survival mode, they will do things they never would have done otherwise. Oh, the decisions we make in our fear. Oh, the words we say in our fear. Oh, the arguments we have when we're anxious. Oh, the foolish consequences that come to businessmen and moms and dads and roommates. Friendships that end forever because people couldn't hold their tongue in fear. You get irrational when you're in fear because you're in survival mode. But friends, where Jesus is going with this is you do not need to be the one that's, that's holding your survival together. That's someone else's job. Number one, fear is the villain. Number two, father is the hero. <laughs> father is the hero. Look at this, verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. I, I like what Jesus, he's like, listen, he's telling you no, don't fear. And here's, now he's telling you how. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Look, look, consider, consider. Look at this. And yet your heavenly father. He doesn't even drop the word master again. He, he, he's, he's making this way more personal now. It's not yet the almighty master of the universe hooks them up. No, he says, your heavenly father feeds them. Now, guys, just to do a quick pause, unless you think Jesus is a liar, and I don't think he is, and I don't think he's just speaking in metaphor, that means if you've ever watched a bird eating seed off the ground, God was feeding him. I mean, I don't know if you've ever done that, just be like, glory to God. For what? The bird. 
If you've ever watched an animal, he says, your heavenly father feeds them. Now watch where he's going. Are you not of more value than they? Listen to me, child of God. You have immense value. (laughs) Your father in heaven has a value on you. Some of you would say, man, but my earthly parents told me that I have no value. If your earthly parents did tell you that, your earthly parents, I bet you were speaking in fear. And when you are in fear, you will say irrational, ridiculous things. But your father who has no fear, this is what he says. You have value. You matter. You matter more than you even imagine that you matter. Some of you are 57 years old and you're like, you know what? There's not much to my life and I don't even know how much longer I'm going to live. 57-year-old ma'am, 59-year-old sir, 19-year-old young man, 16-year-old young lady, you matter to God. Are you not of more value? Look at the birds, man. He hooks them up. He's going to hook you up too. Well, I want something better than bird seed. He's got stuff better than bird seed for you. See, fear is the villain. Father is the hero. See, what the world does, here's what the world does. The world tries to talk me out of my fear with logic and reason and facts. This is what the world says. You're about to get on a plane and someone comes up. Has this ever happened to you? You're about to get on the plane. Oh my gosh, I'm so afraid. And and you're like clenching. You ever sat next to someone? They're clenching their knuckles and and they're freaking out. And this is what the world does. The world says, hey man, you do realize you're actually in more danger when you're driving a car than when you're on an airplane. (laughs) Have you ever heard someone say that? Statistically speaking, it's a fact. The the, the truth of the matter, sir, is that uh, when you get off and you go get your rental car, that's when you should really be afraid because that's where you got a really good chance to die. (laughs) Drunk drivers. There's not a lot of drunk, you know, airplane guys. There's not a lot, but there's a lot of drunk drivers. Okay, no one's up here, you know, you know, doing puff the magic dragon. That's happening down there on the ground. Okay, <laughs> I don't know why that was in my mind. <laughs> I was driving next to someone on the way to church this morning. It was puff the magic dragon coming out. I was like, wow. I mean, I was flying kind of high, almost just with my window down. Anyway, not really, not really, not really. <laughs> Speaking of weeds, Ruth and I were walking this week. <laughs> My wife and I were walking this week, and, and I kid you not, so we, we took this little walk, and in our neighborhood, someone just has these weeds. That Have you ever seen weeds that are like flat? You're like, is that a, she, Ruth, you said, is that a flower or is that a weed? They were so pretty. So pretty. And, and someone was like mowing their yard. They just mow them. They, they just, they just, I mean, they were pretty enough that you could have picked them up, put them in a, a vase, and, and brought them to your house, and just said, man, check those things out. Those things are so beautiful. But yet, look what, look what Jesus says. He says, in which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? See, fear is the villain. Father is the hero. Father's the hero. See, here's what I want you to see. The way the world tries to talk you out of your fear is saying, hey, man, there's a really good chance you're going to be okay. Someone gets a doctor's report, and the doctor's like, hey, man, this is a sickness, and uh, you have a 60% chance of living. To which, how many of you would be a little concerned if the doctor said, you have a 60% chance of living? Imagine if someone came and said, come on, man, chances are you're going to (laughs) live. There's only a 40% chance that you're going to die. Okay, that wouldn't be real. Watch, Jesus never is telling people, hey, man, statistically speaking, it's safer to fly than to, to, than to drive. Statistically speaking, there's a better chance that you're going to live than you're... That's not... Jesus never offers partial fact. This is what Jesus always does. Consider the lilies of the field. Your father does it. Consider the birds. Your father does it. Watch. Jesus never denies the reality of what's going on. So when Jesus is talking to you in your moment of anxiety because you're freaking out about some doctor's report that's in your hand, Jesus never says, it's no big deal. Jesus never says, don't think about it. Jesus never 
never says, oh no, just, just to regard that. Jesus never says, don't read it. Jesus never says, act like it's not true. What he says is, don't act like that's the only fact on the table because the other fact on the table is, yes, you've got problems. Yes, you've got issues. Yes, you've got challenges. Yes, you've got difficulties. Yes, you've got threats. But yes, you have a father. Jesus doesn't talk us out of our fears with facts. He talks us out of our fears with our Father, which art in heaven. He says, stop acting like those are all the facts. Yes, your honor, everything that they've said is perfectly factual, but is incomplete because the one thing they've left out is Father. And guys, I got to tell you, man, Father trumps everything. Father, go, you could go ahead and do whatever you want to do. Then Father comes in and boom, there it is. See, fear is the villain. Father is the hero. What Jesus is saying, you think you need food. You think you need clothes. What Jesus is saying is, when I am your master, when I am your father, you're going to get clothes. You're going to get food. I'm going to hook you up. I'm going to be there with you. I'm not going to leave. You've got a villain whose name is fear, but you've got a hero whose name is... Uh, By the way, this this is the entire sermon right now. You don't get free by the power of a master. You get free by the love of a father. That's how you get freedom. How do you get free of anxiety? You don't get free from anxiety by the, by the power of a good enough master, by the size of a big enough 401k, by the might of a good enough job. You get free by the love of a father. By the love of a father. And your father adores you. Your father adores you. Maybe someone hasn't told you that this week. Your father adores you. I mean adores you. I mean adores you. If your heart has not beat fast in the last seven days for the love that your father has for you, it is not because it's not true. It's because somehow you haven't aligned your heart in the spot where you're like, what? I don't deserve that. It's still true. I don't need that. I I might feel like that's not true. You've got a love from father that is yours for the receiving if you'll take it. See, fear is the villain. Father is the hero. That immigrant who assumed that peace would come by esca- from escaping from mud, that is, the reality is where the peace doesn't come from getting off the mountain. The peace comes from ascending the mountain of the Lord and becoming his child. That college student that assumed that I need to have all of these things to go in and become something. No, the reality is what that college student, former college student needs now as a, as a worker in the field of law is to say, wait, I've got a father that's going to show me where I need to go and what it is that I need to do. I, I read something from a friend this week. Um, she, one of the men in the church was walking up to her husband. And he felt like he had a word from the Lord. And the word was, hey, I feel like I had a word. He said, hey, the word is God is going to do three financial miracles for you this year. And you need to tell your wife. He went up to the husband. You're going to get three financial miracles this year. And your wife needs to stop worrying about money. Well, that felt like a little presumptuous to her, she said, because she had never met this guy, although she definitely didn't want to worry about money. A few months later, though, they got a letter in the mail from the IRS that they owed $1,600. By the way, have any of you guys ever gotten promises from God? You're like, I'm going to bless you. And then it feels like the opposite happens. Has that ever happened to anybody? That's always fun. But do you want your, do you want your story to be boring or are you going to have a redemption story? What kind of story do you want? You know what I mean? Like, don't you want to live a life that's worth watching the movie of? Anyway. Well, we didn't have $1,600, so I called the IRS, and as we went over the forms that we had submitted months before, they realized that not only did we not owe them anything, but they actually owed us money. The IRS agent explained that she had to ask my permission to authorize them to refund us $1,300. I said, you have my permission. (laughs) Two more times that year, we received over $1,000 completely out of the blue. That was part one of what he said, the three financial miracles. All that left was for me to do my part and stop worrying about money. All right, I want to speak it over some of you guys. In the name of Jesus, may the Lord do financial miracles over your life. May the Lord show himself as wonderfully generous as he is. May he amaze you with his provision. And you need to stop worrying about money. Who receives it? (laughs) I received part A. No, I want you to take part A and part B. Okay, Mike, I'm telling you, God wants to set some people free today. I want you to repeat. Okay, we're going to do a little uh, group confession right now. How many of you guys would acknowledge at some point in the last 30 years of your life, you have feared at least one time for money, all right? Right now, I want you to repeat after me. Say, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Let's keep going. Say, I will fear no evil. 
For God is with me. His word and his spirit, they comfort me. Say, I am of God, and I overcome him who is the devil. For greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against me will prosper. For my righteousness is of the Lord. Whatever I do will prosper. For I am like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water. I'm an overcomer, and I overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of my testimony. And I will not love my life, even unto death. I delight myself in the Lord, and he gives me the desires of my heart, because he tells the truth. I give, and it is given unto me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, it comes into my bosom. And my God shall supply all my need according to his riches in glory. Now someone act like you believe that's true right now. South Florida? Yes. Amen. You could say, well, why are you saying all that? Because that's the scripture. And Jesus says, stop talking probabilities on earth and start including all of the truths of heaven. You don't get out of your anxiety by arguing with the facts on earth. You get out of your anxiety by introducing the realities of heaven. Fear is your villain. Father is your hero. And number three, you've got a secret weapon. I'm going to give you a secret weapon. And here it is. Verse 32 says, the Gentiles seek after all these things. Your heavenly father knows that you need all of them. But, and here's your secret weapon. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. This is the first verse I ever memorized in Spanish. Mas buscad primeramente el reino de Dios y su justicia y todas estas cosas os serán añadidas. Mas buscad. Seek, seek. More, more. Mas, more. Buscad, seek primeramente. First. Seek first. Seek First, Mike, what do you want me to even do with this sermon? The next time you're anxious this week, I want you to memorize this. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. In fact, why don't you say it with me? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Uh Uh-oh, I got a bill. I'm not sure I can pay my bills. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. We're going to do it one more time. You're going, to get a, you're going to get some notice. You're going to have something that happens. Your boss is going to say your job is in danger. We're about to downsize. And you're going to think in your mind, uh-oh, I might lose my job. Well, what could happen? Well, then I won't have money. Well, then what could happen? Well, then we won't have Netflix. Well, what else could happen? Then we won't have food. Well, what else could happen? Well, then we won't have enough money to feed the kids. And what could happen? Do you play this whole thing. Do you think that's what's going to happen? Because when you do, say it with me, seek first the kingdom of God and his all these things will what, South Florida? Be added unto you. See, see the first, it's almost embarrassing. When I was a senior in high school, my mom, I, I was not following Jesus. My mom took out a half-page ad in my yearbook, and she put that verse. A big, fat picture of my face in this verse. Seek first, the kingdom of God is... I was so embarrassed. I'm like, Mom... I'm like, what are you doing? I mean, it's, I was like, it's for everyone to see. I'm not even a Christian. I'm not even following Jesus. Hey, parents, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Some of you are so fretting over, I want my child to come home. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. Does Jesus lie? No. He doesn't lie. See, you've got a secret weapon. The, see, anxiety, it always feels like something's happening to me. When I'm anxious, I feel like th- there's nothing I can do. And yet Jesus says, when you're anxious, there is something you can do. You can give God the first. Let me get, I just want to get clear on this. There is a principle of the first. Everyone say first. I'm, guys, this is not just about money, but it includes money. It's about everything. God is the God who asks for the first. Yes, this is in the law of Moses, but I need you to know this is beyond law. This is a principle. 
This is a principle of life. Whatever food you eat first thing in the morning, whatever you eat first, they tell us, affects your cravings for the rest of the day. Wherever you, whatever you seek first when it comes to, to alimentation, when it comes to food, when it comes to nourishment, that's going to guide, that's going to lead your taste buds. So this morning, I just with pure grit drank a kale shake for breakfast, okay? I'm not sure who enjoys kale. I just put a lot of peanut butter on it because peanut butter covers a multitude of sins, all right? Or, or of nasty, right? So first, there's a principle of the first portion of your time, okay? Again, I'm not into being legalistic on this. What I'm telling you is when I'm tempted with anxiety, there is a secret weapon of first. When I, ro- when I get out of bed almost every day, I roll off my bed, even if I need to go to the bathroom. I roll off my bed, I get on my knees, And I say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. There's nothing new because you were. There's nothing too hard right now because you are. And there's no surprises because you are to come. Sometimes I just say it, and I I need you to catch. It's not like I don't need to go to the bathroom. I do need to go to the bathroom. But even before I need to go to the bathroom, I need my soul to know God is first. I am not, listen, I'm not going to read emails before I give God my first. You could say, Mike, is that a law? No, it's not a law. What I'm telling you, it's a principle, which is, do you struggle with anxiety Seek six times. He's mentioning this is this seek first. Matthew 6.33 is in the context of a little nugget of scripture where six times he says, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. Well, Lord, do you have any practical application? Yeah. Seek first. Seek first. 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 Give me the first part of your day. Let me have access. Let the Bible have access to your day before you go to social media, before you read a text, before you look at the weather, before you look at the stocks, before you look at seek first. See, fear is the villain, father's the hero, but you got a secret weapon, and that is first. And when it comes to money, I got paid yesterday. When it comes to money, the first portion should go to God. This is a principle with money. Because whoever gets your first, see, Father is always revealed in the, in, in the days of, of Moses, it would be like, hey, the firstborn belongs to God. You've got 10 sheep. And you're, you're, whichever one comes out first, you don't know when they're all pregnant. You've got 10 pregnant sheep. God says, all right, give me the first. That, that's what the tithe was. God picked a number because he knew we were legalists at heart. They'd be like, well, how much would be enough? He said, okay, 10%. 10% is a good training wheel starting point. Take the, so if you had 10 pregnant sheep, the first would go to God. Now watch, there's two ways people live. Some people believe in including God, but they are leftover givers. They always give God leftovers. Even if they believe in 10%, they believe in, well, I'll give money, whether it's 10% or 2%. The average Christian gives 2 to 3%, but in America at least. Um, but the, so they'll give leftovers. But I want you to follow me on this. If Renee and Phil were going to come over to my house, I'm like, man, I'm so excited for you guys to come over. Man, Renee, like Renee had us over at her house a while back. The food was amazing. It was just really, really good. Imagine if I said, come on over, guys. I want you to come over to the house. And we're going to get ready. It's going to be awesome. And they come over and... And we all sit down, we're like, so what's for dinner? It's like, well, we got a little bit of spaghetti left over, and we're Puerto Rican, so we all got chicken and rice. We got some four-day-old chicken and rice, and, and we got a, like a, a Stouffer's lasagna over here. We're just going to mix it all together, and we're so glad you guys are here. We're celebrating with leftovers. How many of you wouldn't feel real honored? And yet I meet Christians all the time that they say, God, I'll give you yours after I pay the rent after I pay the utility bill, after I make the car payment, after I get 18 Starbucks, after I pay Netflix. And if there's something left over, I sure hope you feel honored with my four-day-old Stouffer's lasagna. (laughs) Now, what God says is, you want to get rid of anxiety? Let me tell you how you do it. Seek first. Give God the first. Guys, this is, sometimes I'll just forget and I'll, and I'll start to get anxious about money. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I'm like, oh, no, no, I'm still going to go give. No, no, it's not just giving, it's giving first. I'm still going to pray. I'm telling you, there's something about praying first. 
Even if all of your prayer time's not in the morning, I, I promise you, try it for a week and watch what happens if you roll off onto your knees, if you give God the first part of the day and say, God, before any other voice gets into this brain, you get to get into this brain because you are my father. Fear is my enemy. Father is my hero. But first is this, first is like the secret weapon that almost turns your spiritual Wi-Fi on. And now you start getting these push notifications in the spirit because you've already gone online, because you're already dialed up. This week was the first day of my, just hired an assistant, Angelica, and the very first thing that we did before we did anything else, before we had a conversation, before we did anything else, before we talked about any of the agenda items, first thing we do is to call upon the Lord. First, mas buscad primeramente. Seek first with your money. Seek first with your talents. Seek first. You're getting ready to go on vacation. When you get in the car, seek first. When I go to India and I'm with oh, whatever country missionary Sam lives in, when I'm over there and, and we get in the car, every time we get in the car, he says, before we leave, shall we pray? I was like, why would you do that? And then he started driving. I'm like, oh, that's why you do it. Because, <laughs> because we could die right now, but also because there's a principle of first, first. Okay, Mike, what do you want me doing today? Number one, if the next time you've got Anxiety, I want you to quote Matthew 6.33. Number two, I dare you for some period of time to take the first portion of your money. I would, I would, I would suggest starting with 10%, the first 10%. Give God the first overs, not the leftovers, and watch how God comes and honors you. Let me just end it like this. See, we have a problem with fear, and it's not that fear is not real. It's just that fear makes you process information without God, and that's never going to happen. I'm not denying your doctor's report. I'm saying God is here. I'm not denying the struggle. I'm saying God is here. I'm asking you to seek first the kingdom, and I'm going to end it like this. And John, I want you to get ready to take it in South Florida because there's been a lot of storms, and the storms are real, and we have a lot of trees in my neighborhood. And you can hear, have you ever heard trees cracking? It's kind of frightening. So one of my girls, Anaya, she, she's pretty tough, but she doesn't like that sound. And so storms are going and she's doing her thing and I'm in bed and I, all I want to do is sleep and I do not have the gift of waking up in the middle of the night. Like that is not my spiritual gift. And so my daughter, Anaya, comes in and she knocks on the door and she said, can I come in? I'm like, no, go back to your room. But it's thundering and it's lightning and you can see the lightning outside and you hear trees falling and, and, it's, and it, it is kind of frightening. So I said, go back to your room. She goes back to her room and, and then she comes back again. It's like three, four times a night. She, finally, I just got tired of waking up. I said, baby, go ahead. Just get in bed with us. And so she kind of goes and wiggles her way in between me and Ruthie and and then thunder and lightning go off again. I heard a big crack and I, my eyes were open. I'm like, oh my, I mean, I was like, is my house under attack right now, you know? And I looked over at her and she's sleeping like a baby. <laughs> Nothing had changed on the outside. The only thing that had changed was the inside because she knew that daddy is on my side. I will not fear. What can a storm do to me? I'm asking you to believe in Jesus as much as my daughter believes in me. That the same girl that could not get back to sleep all night long with nothing but my presence falls asleep. Fear is your enemy. Father's your hero. 